Hey, so so we'll kind of jump right in. You know, I, I kind of asked you, uh, you know, what are some of the, the commonly asked questions, the things that you get a lot? So we'll start with those. And then we've already got a bunch of questions kind of coming in. So, uh, you know, in, in that category of new rules, just just tell us, you know, about about the re-emphasis on putting the ball in play, correct ways to do that, because that does confuse people. Yeah, there's a re-emphasis on putting the ball in play correctly because it's so important to the new rule where you can make yourself live and then shoot and score. So uh, the defender needs to know uh, when they're able to attack. Um, it also helps the uh, clock keeper, the timekeeper, to know when to uh, start the clock after a foul. So there has been a re-emphasis on correctly putting the ball in play. I think that is the number one question uh, that I get, um, especially recently with the new rules. So, uh, yeah, like you said, it's a re-emphasis. So it's always been on the books. Uh, some people think that it's new. It's definitely not. Um, uh, there is an emphasis to clearly and visibly put the ball in play. So there's a couple ways to do that, right? So you can throw the ball up in the air. Um, you can drop it from a raised hand onto the water. Um, you can toss the ball in front of you before you start swimming with it. You can't just come up on a ball and dribble through and swim. That's a that's a turnover. Um, you can also obviously pass to another pl no, pass to another player, and then you can also, if you switch hands above the water, um, that is also putting in play. So basically, a couple of things need to happen. You have to have separation with the ball, hand, and water at some point. Not on the same order it doesn't have to be in the same order but at some point all three of those must have separation and clear separation as well so super helpful and also for anyone watching this now you know we're going to go over a lot of water polo rules uh, this is going to be saved on our, on our instagram page for 24 hours so you can refer back to this uh the next one that comes up a lot we know about two meters five meters but six meters was recently introduced and fouls from you know behind within six meters going towards the goal you know, just kind of explain that. I think everyone thinks there's supposed to be a lot of penalties. We're seeing more penalties. How does that rule fit in? Yeah, so I, I think there, the misconception is that now um, it makes a, uh, a penalty an automatic, which there's no such thing in water polo as automatics. Um, so uh, first things first, it must be a probable goal situation. So if the player is in a probable goal situation, facing the goal or going towards the goal, and if a defender from behind, the only way they can defend properly is to touch the ball or the hand only. If they touch anything else that does not allow the player to continue the action, to continue to get a shot off and to be able to play, that's where the penalty comes in. So the referee must allow the player to complete the action. So just because you're touching or hitting the arm or you're sinking, uh, the first things first, the referee must ask themselves, are they able, is the player able to continue the action? If the answer is yes, they have to withhold the whistle and see if, they could, if a natural goal could be scored. Uh, if not, and um, that action cannot continue, that is when the referee will interject and call it a five-meter penalty. Because I think right previously before that rule, you, you know, you'd, you'd only see the penalty on a defender from behind. You'd so often see that center player, right, like turn towards the goal and then drop the ball and right. wait for the person on their back. And then that was always an easy five call. Here, it seems to open up some more opportunities for a penalty. Uh, absolutely. There is going to be an uptick of penalties. Um, and I think uh, it, by the time the players adjust to it, I think the, the numbers will decrease after the players adjust to the style. But yeah, even now still, if the player turns inside water, they drop the ball, the referee should still give about a, a good second or two to see if they are able to then continue, pick up the ball and shoot. If not, if they're being prevented, then it must be a penalty. You know, and, and you bring up a great point there. I think, you know, we'll obviously get into this a bit more, but uh, I think officials, right, want, want to see the players score natural goals. But players often are thinking about you know, playing for the call or playing for the whistle, right? To your point, but it sounds like in a lot of these cases, the referee wants to give leeway for the player to make the play before a call has to be called. Right, absolutely. That is the, uh, that is the emphasis, is to allow natural goals. Everybody wants to see a natural goal. Uh, so, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, going from there, and this, and this has been a new one as well, uh, getting yourself live and then, and then having the ability to score. We know we've seen it now in the corners around the restart at two meters. Uh, you, that's, that's, a, that's a live situation now where it wasn't always in the past. Correct. Uh, yeah, so now you don't need to pass uh, to another player when you're outside of six meters and you receive a foul. You can just 
clearly, like we stated, pop the ball, drop it on the surface of the water, put it in play clearly, and then now you are free to do and go anywhere and shoot and score. Um, same with a corner throw. Um, the only time where um, – you can do it directly from a corner throw or from a foul outside of uh, six meters. Um, in other cases, whether it's a restart after a goal, after a timeout, uh, at a start of a period, any kind of restart of a game, you cannot shoot directly, but you can put yourself live and then shoot and score. So in those times as well, a lot of people don't know that. Yeah, no, it's still, it's, you know, definitely caught some goalies off guard. I know that much when they, when they were not ready for those shots coming from yeah. the corners. Uh, yeah. The last one here, and then we want to get to some questions. We're talking with Levon Dermenji, USA Water Polo, uh, National Referee Manager, and Levon's ref at uh, a whole variety of levels, so so knows knows the rules inside now. But uh, this idea of a flying sub or what we also call like a hockey substitute, what is right. what is the right procedure for this, and how do you do it? Yeah, um, well, first things first, you have to have a pool with sidelines of at least a half meter from the wall. Um, so it, that's not a lot of space. So you just need an adequate amount of space to, to do it. Uh, that's first. The second thing is uh, you have to, the sub, the flying sub must be initiated from the bench. The player must get into the water in the corner nearest their bench. They do not walk out to the two, to the goal line, to the five meter, and then jump in the pool. So first they hop in the pool right in, uh, next to their bench. Then they have to swim along the wall underneath a lane line or two um, and go anywhere from their goal line to the half is that they can be. Um, after that, the player who's subbing out must come out of the pool fully. They must surface. Um, and then once they surface, there has to be a tag of hands um, above the water. Then the, the sub can enter. Uh, the player who is exiting now has to swim down the, um, down the side of the pool and then get out after they cross the goal line nearest their bench. They would have to hop out of the pool. Excellent. So thanks for those explanations on, on a couple of rules here. Now we're going to jump into some questions here. So, so feel free to uh, – Add your questions here in the comments, and we'll and we'll get them over to Levon. I'm just kind of scrolling back now through a lot of um, the questions here. We got one earlier, and this is, you know, I'll I'll try and frame it in a way that you can answer as an official. The question was generally, what's the best way to steal the ball? And I, and I guess I'll frame it to you: what's the best way to steal the ball without getting a call against you? Well, uh, to answer that correctly, let me uh, answer what. What constitutes an ordinary foul for referees? Uh, any type of uh, contact or impeding that does not allow the player to freely move the ball constitutes a foul. So uh, any time that you're going over to steal the ball, odds are that's going to be a foul. So as long as you're going around and underneath, especially trying to pop the ball up underneath, uh, that is going to be your best bet on how to steal a ball. We got a few, uh, a few questions here about about outside six meters. We've we've kind of uh, covered those. So I'm just kind of scrolling through here and and see what else is uh, is happening. Um, Owen asks, how long does a player that just got a free throw? How long can a player that just got a free throw can they can they wait before they get alive? So I think what he's asking is after you've been awarded that free throw. Do you, you know, is there, is there an imaginary clock counting? How fast do you have to make a move there? Great question. So this year, what we did was uh, we are now going to undo delay as opposed to having to put the ball in play immediately. So NC2A and, and NFHS High School are currently doing this is where uh, you have a reasonable amount of time to put the ball in play. A reasonable amount of time shall be no more than three seconds is what we tell uh, referees. So it doesn't mean you have up to three seconds. It just shall be no more than three seconds. So um, it's at the discretion of the referee, just like it is in NC2A and in high school. Um, we are instructing referees to hold up the direction of the attack when the ball is not put in play. And then when the referee drops their arm um, to them, that means the ball is in play. Um, now, I would say sometimes uh, referees hold their hand up longer than they should or they drop it um, quicker than they should. I would say just as a defender, wait to see the ball released and put properly into play before you are able to attack. Um, if that's not the case, then watch the referee and hopefully they'll give you the signal uh, by lowering their arm. Getting another question here from TQ, just talking about 
uh, play around two meters inside water rules. You know, essentially he asks or she asks, I'm not sure who this is, but at, at what point does the defense get the opportunity to try and get around? And at what point does the offense need, need to try and finish? feels like referees are making calls really, really quick at two meters. Well, and then that's the problem, right? They're, we should not, uh, the referee should not be making quick calls, uh, right? When they make a move and then um, it's not an automatic like we talked about. So I would say the referees must give a, a second or two, split second, um, to see if the player can finish and then also allow the player to swim around. Uh, so there should be adequate time. Um, so hopefully um, they have those referees and this uh, person who's asking the question uh, could have a better, better experience with that. Sure. We're talking with LaVonda Menjian here, USA Water Polo National Referee Manager. Uh, just taking your questions here, um, Amelia asks, do you have to make the ball live when a six on five is called? Correct. So anytime a foul is awarded, uh, whether it's an exclusion, an ordinary foul, you have to put the ball live where where the where the spot of the ball is now. Uh, let's see. It looks like maybe Aaron is is this person's name. What are the specific rules when a field player is trying to steal the ball from the goalie? A uh, goalie is like every other player. Um, I think some people think that uh, you know certain things apply to goalies when it doesn't to others. Um, it should, it's the same across the board, just like how it would be an ordinary foul against any other player. Uh, referees should treat the goalie exactly the same. And I'll, I'll kind of jump on that because I, I know a call that will confuse people is what, what is a goalie doing wrong when they get excluded? Usually what we tend to see with goalies is, uh, they're not very subtle at f coming fouls. Um, so I think that's the biggest key is that uh, when they come out to steal the ball or um, what have you, they uh, they tend to go hard and fast and a lot of times over the top, which then gets them excluded, especially when you now have an open cage. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's a penalty, um, but it, it definitely is an exclusion. Got it. Okay. So goalies, ease up on your fouls. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, how long does a defender have to wait to return to the player he or she fouled after committing the foul? So they have to back up, right? And then what's that count before they can reapproach? Uh, same as before. So it, it's it's a reasonable amount of time, and it shall be no more than three seconds. So um, you know the referees have to do um, their due diligence of turning the ball over after that reasonable amount of time. Uh, if not, uh, the the player should look to the referee. In most cases, the, that referee will drop their arm uh, to signal that the ball is in play. But uh, they can just look at the player. Uh, if the player must put the ball clearly in play within a reasonable amount of time. Once they do so, they can attack. Getting a bunch of questions here. This is great stuff. Keep your questions coming for, for LeVon. And uh, some of these questions I'm going to kind of frame in the idea of avoiding foul calls, that sort of thing. So Jordan asks, what's what's the best way to release effectively? And, you know, I'm going to add to that, I guess, without without having a call go go against you. How do you release effectively? Correct. Meaning? I have to think that maybe in like a, in like a tangle between two players, maybe in transition, how do you, how do you release off of each other to avoid maybe a backcourt foul, something like that? <laughs> right. In most cases, the referee should give a split second. So, uh, for example, an ordinary foul on the perimeter. If a player is holding the ball, it is not a foul. You can sink, hold, and uh, pull back a player who's holding the ball as long as it's not violent or overaggressive, right? So if a player is fouling a player that's holding the ball, there should be no whistle. But once that player releases the ball, the referee should give a split second for the defender to show, hey, I'm no longer fouling and the referee should not blow an ordinary foul. So I would say to that uh, player that uh, they have a split second to, if they're fouling, their hands on the play and they're fouling, once that ball is released, they now have a split second to show, hey, I'm, not, I'm no longer fouling, or they run the risk of getting an ordinary foul called against them. You, you touched on this a little bit previously, but M. Byers asks, do you have to pop the ball up every time you get fouled? So, you know, again, again that question about making yourself live, right? Right. Well, unless you're going to pass it immediately, let's say you're passing it, then you don't have to. Um, but if you don't pass it within a reasonable amount of time, yes, you either have to pull, pop the ball up 
drop it on the surface of the water, you have to make it live so the defender and the clock keeper know that the ball is in play. Uh, Kyle asks, can you, can you foul and shoot inside five? I'm, I'm thinking he means can you, can you get fouled and take a shot inside five meters? No. So uh, for the new six-meter rule, both the foul and the ball must be outside of six for the player to shoot directly or to make themselves live and shoot. So let's say, for example, the foul's at six and a half meters. If the player fouls and then as they foul, they move the ball inside of six meters. They, they push the ball inside of six meters. Now, guess what? So now that offensive player cannot go inside of six meters, take the ball, and then either make it live or shoot directly. They're now essentially a passer. Um, so that is, uh, that is a very important um, thing with, with the new rules now because now that becomes a tactical foul. So referees uh, are going to be addressing that more. So if you foul and you move the ball inside of six meters or you throw it away, uh, you know, those are called uh, tactical fouls and they'll be, um, they'll be exclusions. We're talking with LeVon Dermenji and USA Water Polo uh, National Referee Manager and a longtime referee in his own right. Uh, Valentina asks, what, what are the exact rules for a jump ball? Um, in, in regards to when they're called or the way they're, they're conducted. So when they're called usually is when um, there's a difference of opinion of the referees on who committed a foul. If, uh, if one referee believes it was uh, one player and the other one believes it's another, you'll have a jump ball situation. Or many times you'll see if the ball goes underwater, uh, the referees don't know exactly who took it underwater. You'll see that a lot of times in the sprint, right? They go for the ball and the ball goes underwater on a sprint and the referee conducts a jump ball. So uh, the rules regarding that is the two closest players to the action when the ball was, um, let's say the, the neutral throw was called, those two players are involved in the jump ball. And the jump ball is basically like a, a basketball jump ball where the referee will toss it in the air uh, so that both players have an equal opportunity to play the ball. Excellent. This uh, next question I, I, I really like here from TC Aquatic. I was going to ask it myself, but when when is the best time to communicate and talk with a referee about questions or certain calls? Is this during the game? Who should be doing it? You know, what, what do referees want to hear and what don't they want to hear as far as communication goes? Well, definitely not during the game. I'll tell you that. Um, we, uh, the job of a referee, especially in water polo, is a very difficult one. So when we have distractions, when we have players uh, trying to talk, parents, players, coaches, during the game while the action is going on, it's uh, very distracting. So uh, the most appropriate uh, time to talk to a player is with, at the uh, regular stoppages. Uh, quarter breaks, timeouts uh, are the best times. Uh, after a goal is, is not the best time to, to address the referee, especially if you're a player in the water. Um, I would say allow your coach to handle it at those appropriate times. Um, but referees should talk to uh, players if, as long as it's um, at the appropriate time and uh, they're just seeking an, an answer to a question. I don't see why a referee would not answer those questions. Uh, they're actually encouraged to talk to uh, coaches and, and captains of teams uh, during appropriate times. Yeah, I think that's one of the, one of the challenges of being a referee is uh, you can you can get a bad rap in being a ref in any sport, right? But to your point, most most of the officials in water polo they they want to be helpful, I think, and explain what is going on and what was called, but at the right time. Absolutely. We're taking questions here from Lavander Menjian, uh, USA Water Polo National ref Referee Manager and longtime official. Got a couple of your questions just just asked here. Uh, also, Lavander, an expert in refereeing, not not necessarily in playing. No knock on his playing skills, but we are getting questions about. Uh, the best way to take a five-meter shot, maybe not his area. Uh, yeah. But that brings up a, a question. There, Every time a five-meter is called, there's always posturing among the shooter and the goalie. Mm -hmm. The goalie comes off the line. The shooter tries to inch in. How how challenging is that dance to kind of officiate between the two? Uh, it is. Well, we, we instruct the referees to conduct the penalty throws as quickly as possible. You don't want to freeze the shooter, as they say. So, uh, yeah, you're going to have a goalie who's going to try to get away with uh, coming out a little too far, the shooter going in. Uh, technically, by rule, neither the shooter nor the goalkeeper can actually move from their respective positions until the ball is released out of the shooter's hand. So if the, the ball is released out of the shooter's hand at four meters instead of five meters, 
that's a turnover. You cannot, uh, you know, of course, there's going to be some fall through with your shot. But uh, what we say for referees is if your first move is to go forward instead of to go up to start your shot, that's a good indication that you're moving forward um, and you're going to be too close to the cage before you uh, before you shoot. So and then same with the goalkeeper. So I think we have we give a little leeway to both goalkeepers and shooters. So let's say on the whistle, the, the player will come forward a little bit. The goalkeeper will come forward a little bit. Uh, as long as one or the other is not drastic, we kind of just let it go. We're talking with Levon Dermenji, and if you have your questions here, we'll go a few more minutes. Levon, as, as we're talking, has other things kind of come to mind? Are there, are there other things outside of the new rules, just general water polo rules that you find like you get, you get asked about often? Um, yeah, I think we covered most of them. Uh, the ball, where it lies, is, is, is big as well because um, as long as it's outside of the defending two-meter area, uh, the ball, the free throw must be taken where the ball lies. So you cannot pick up the ball and now move it to another uh, place to take a free throw uh, without putting the ball live first. Uh, one of the questions uh, that I got was, well, if I get a foul outside of six and the ball's knocked inside of, uh, of six, can't I just pick up the ball, bring it out, and then, then shoot it directly? No. Unfortunately, with the new rule of where the ball, the, putting the blade, ball in play where it lies, you got to take it right then and there. And if the ball is inside of six meters, unfortunately, it can't be, it can't be shot, whether directly or after you put yourself live. We, we've talked a lot about these uh, kind of counts, right? Uh, kind of no more than three seconds for this or that. You mentioned two meters. What is, what is the rule of thumb on being inside the two without the ball? How fast do you have to get out of there? What's the, what's the typical standard? Right. Uh, so if, if a player goes inside the two um, and they just briefly go in and they don't affect play and then within a split second, they just they realize, oh, OK, uh, I'm inside the two. I need to get back out. Um, once they make an effort to get back out, no harm, no foul. So we're, we're good. Uh, if a player goes inside the two and then just stays there, um, you know, two seconds, three seconds, uh, the referee will then um, call a inside the two meter violation. So regardless of where you are inside the two, just you being inside the two is a violation. And if you, and if, especially if you stay there, so. Uh, I know a part of your job is, is getting new folks to officiate. And we got a great question in here. Uh, I believe it was from Halby is, uh, how old do you have to be to referee and how can you get involved? Um, you know, 16 is a really good age to start if you uh, if you want to start when you're really young. Uh, I think back in the day, uh, we had a referee who started at 15. Um, it, it's tough because, um, you know, depending on the age group, you're limited to, you don't want to be a 16-year-old refing 18-year-olds, right? Sure. That would be a little difficult. So um, i say, you know, to start with lower level 10s, 12s, um, you know, if you're in high school, 16 is a, is a good age. I think, um, I think, yeah, that'll be a, a great idea. It's great for um, side income, especially college students, uh, to have some side income. It's, uh, it's really, it's, it's a good opportunity. Excellent stuff there. Uh, another one coming in here. We'll, we'll, we'll take a few more questions here with Levon Dermenji, and USA Waterfall National Referee Manager. Uh, what, what are the rules when the goalie is holding the ball near the last possession of the game? Can the other team attack and they just sit on the ball and run the clock out? Do they have to advance? How does that work? So, uh, yeah, so this is the uh, wasting time or stalling uh, question, right? So um, it, is not, it is not a fan favorite amongst many people, referees, coaches, players, I think. Uh, the consensus is the the team who is winning uh, deserves to win many times, right? So, um, being that it's not a very popular rule, um, there's no there's no mandate that the ball must go forward. Uh, there is a mandate that the offense must continue playing offense. So, what does that mean? Um, if you're in the backcourt and you're just holding on and you're not looking to pass the ball to anybody, or you're you know you're passing it to your teammates back and forth in the backcourt, not really trying to play any kind of offense uh, that's that's by definition wasting time um, and uh, should be a turnover so yeah if you're a goalkeeper um, last minute of the game and you're just sitting on the ball without any attempt to actually play offense that's that's what that is yeah and, and then I know a lot of folks will ask as far as the different uh, leagues and levels of water polo they play in right so if you play college water polo, but then you've watched FINA water polo, you play USA water polo, you're also playing high school water polo. 
are all of these fairly close now to kind of one one common set of rules? I know that's been talked about for a long time, but I know that 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 is the occasional question that you refs have to have to answer often. Absolutely, I think that's that's the tough part of being a referee when you're refing in those different uh, levels. You have three different sets of rules you have to remember. Uh, I think we're doing a better job of getting closer. Um, the NFHS Rules Committee is going to meet um, uh, next month uh, to discuss um, new rules. Uh, certainly the new uh, USA Water Polo FINA rules are going to be discussed. Um, NC2A, I believe, is going to do uh, one uh, later, um, uh, I think before summer is their timeline, sometime in May. Um, so I, I think that's the idea, and we're working towards that. I think uh, most people want to see that. Uh, definitely we do. Um, uh, from USA Water Polo side of uh, the rules. So, uh, yeah, I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful that we're uh, we're going to get that done and get as close together as possible. Excellent. Uh, LaVon, really, really appreciate the time. Thanks for uh, answering all these questions. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. We'll hopefully see you, see you back in the whites on the full deck soon. Yeah, I hope so. Thanks, Greg.